1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's begin at 1 Corinthians 4 and verses 1 to 5. The Apostle Paul writes, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And look forward at first or Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Today I want to consider the events following the catching up of the saints. The catching away of true believers, um, we, we consider this to be a glorious event that every Christian should be uh, uh, dwelling on and anticipating, expecting. But uh, after the rapture, that's not all there is. Uh, you'll hear ministers at funerals, at least I do, because I work for a funeral home during the week, and so I, I go to a lot of funerals. <sighs> I try to put the fun back in funeral. Anyway, I hear a lot of ministers at funerals uh, talk about death not being the end of the deceased, but just a new beginning. And I've often wondered, a beginning of what? They're not always very clear about that. If the person died and went to hell as an unbeliever, the minister is certainly not going to mention that. Uh, but if the person was saved and they went to heaven, I've got to tell you, most ministers are incapable of telling you how you can go to heaven too. They're pitiful and pathetic. It's sad. Ministers who you talk to them one-on-one -on -one and you get the strong impression, this guy is saved. This, this guy knows what it means to be born again. But when he opens his mouth to speak, he stumbles all over. His, he trips over his own tongue, has no idea how to explain the simplicity of the gospel, how to be born again. Now, I'm going to commend my father because my dad, over the course of his years it probably preached 2,500 funerals. That's a lot of funerals. A lot of ministers don't preach 200 in a 30-year ministry. But over his uh, years as a preacher, he's preached probably close to 2,500 funerals. Hmm? 2,700, he says. 2,700. And uh, I have to tell you, with, with, without prejudice, my father preaches the best funeral sermon that I've ever heard. And because of my job, I'm exposed to hundreds and hundreds of different types of ministers, preachers, priests, rabbis, New Age, Scientology, you name it. Uh, another preacher used to be here in this town. Uh, I was working a funeral, I was out at the cemetery, and this preacher was the one in charge and uh, leading the funeral. And after the service, I got to talking with him and I told him who my father was and he knew my dad. He said, oh, your dad's a master. Your dad's a master at preaching funerals. And, um, but except for my father, I've heard very, very few ministers who know how to convey the gospel so that the sinner can get it. Uh, brevity is the soul of wit, it's been said. And what a person needs to do is get right to the point. Don't beat around and say, well, you know, give your life to God and do this and that. No, if you're a sinner, you need to be born again. Only the Savior can save. That needs to be made abundantly clear to the audience. You've got a, an audience for just a short time, 15, 20 minutes at the most. And uh, trust me, when people attend funerals, 
They don't want to hear your three or four point outline and your illustrations that you preached last Sunday at church. That's not what they're coming for. Uh, Calvary Chapel ministers can't figure that out. They think everybody's there to hear them uh, ramble on for 35 minutes without saying anything. They're not there to hear uh, some ministers very uh, well worded and lengthy sermon. They want to hear about the person that died. They are there to hear about that person that they knew that they were acquainted with. If the minister can walk them down memory lane and and remind them of things that they they had long forgotten. Oh, I, I remember when he used to say that. I remember when she used to do that. Then the minister has shown that he's put a little bit of effort into, into preparation. And once he does that, now he's entitled to offer them the gospel. But even then, they don't want to hear a whole bunch of it. They want, they, they want you to get right to the point so we can get out of here. I have to go to lunch or something like that. And so I have to say, my dad is a master, having learned over the many years how to do it, get to the point, say what needs to be said, and be very succinct and, and clear in what the people need to hear. So I have to commend my dad for that. But generally speaking, most pastors, ministers, have no idea how to describe the gospel or discuss it or explain it to the audience that needs to hear it. And they'll say, trust in the same God that your Aunt Martha trusted in. Well, that's very loose and, and general. What do you mean by that? And sometimes they'll, they'll say, if you want to see your Uncle Sam again, your Uncle Fred again, then you need to get ready to go to heaven. And they, they, make, someone's, they make the appeal to heaven based upon seeing Uncle Fred again, not seeing Jesus Christ. That's the wrong way to, to present heaven. You don't know if Uncle Sam or Uncle Fred actually did go to heaven. I mean, based on testimony, we have a pretty good idea. If Christian left a good testimony behind, then there's no, there's no uh, mistake about it. But uh, the minister, and, and I hate ministers that come in and say, now, I didn't know the deceased personally, but I can tell he was a really good guy. By all, That's the stupidest thing anybody could say, get up there, and I didn't know them. What are you doing there then? If you're going to get up there and admit that you don't, you didn't know the person and you really didn't know much about them, but you're just kind of judging by, then then give the check back to the funeral home and go back home. I I want to say that to so many ministers, but um, so one of the, the dumbest things a guy can do is say, "I didn't know her personally." If you didn't know him personally, trust me, everybody knows you're a stranger. They've never seen you before. So you don't have to remind them of the obvious. But when you have a, a chance to present the gospel at a setting like a funeral, what better place could there be to explain how to be born again, why a sinner needs to be forgiven of his sins, and how simple it can be to trust in what Jesus Christ did for your sake? It should be a very simple proposition. And it's sad that it's missed by so many preachers. Now, I've rambled on about that long enough. For a true believer, your future shouldn't be a mystery or vague and ambiguous. If you've come to God as a sinner, admitting your guilt and your need to be forgiven and your guilt of sin, trusting that what Jesus Christ did for you is all that can cleanse you from your sin, that you have no righteousness to depend upon whatsoever, and God forgives you on that basis, that he's the solution to your problem, you have hope. You have hope. Other people don't have it. And uh, you have advanced warning, advanced knowledge about what the future holds for you. The Bible says, Revelation 19, verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The Lord doesn't reveal to us what the winning lottery number is going to be next week, or who's going to win the Super Bowl next year. Those things are unimportant to God. But for the believer, in the big scheme of things, things that matter in eternity, we know where we're going. We know what's waiting for us on the other side. We know what's going to happen to this world once we're gone. We know what's going to happen to the unbeliever who dies without Jesus Christ. So I call this sermon today, The Rapture, dot, 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 
Then what? The rapture. Then what? 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The, rap the rapture of the saints will bring a glorious reunion of, among every believer who's ever trusted Christ to save him or her. Since the dying thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And if you recall, they broke the two soldiers, or the two criminals' legs to hasten their death. But when they came to Christ, he was already dead. That means Christ died before that repentant sinner died. And it didn't take him more than a few seconds to prepare a home in heaven for that guy. Thank God for that. But the rapture will bring a glorious reunion for all those who have ever trusted Christ to save them. And so, first of all, let me say this. The first thing waiting for you after the rapture is what we call, point number one, the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Something has to take place before you enjoy eternity with Jesus Christ, and that is what we call the judgment seat of Christ. Paul writes in Romans 14, verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The ultimate judge of a Christian is not another Christian. It's Jesus Christ. and uh, Or the judge of what a Christian is doing in Jesus' name. Now, there's that old uh, statement, Well, I'm not your judge. I'm just a fruit inspector, right? I'm just seeing if you're bearing any good fruit for Jesus... That's just a cheap way of trying to judge somebody and, and cover it up and make it be something else that, it, that you think it's not. But um, Paul writes in a couple of verses later, Romans 14, 13, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. He said, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them, who are of the household of faith, Galatians 6.10, other believers. Uh, you're not the final judge of your brother or your sister in Christ or of their life for Jesus Christ or their efforts to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, which may be completely different than the efforts that you're putting forth or not putting forth. All of that will be revealed and exposed one day at the judgment seat of Christ. Um, nor are you allowed to try and cause the effort of another Christian to, f to falter, to fail, or to come to naught, just because you don't like the way they're doing it. That's not your place. God sees everything, and God is the ultimate judge of it all. And He knows which things are, are useful to Him. You know, uh, God uses all sorts of people to achieve all sorts of ends for the sake of Jesus Christ, and to reach all kinds of other people. For the Lord Jesus Christ. I may, my personality, my demeanor during the week might, might be perfectly suited for certain kinds of people that your personality is not, and vice versa. Remember, how many remember Brother Spurgeon, who's a friend of our ministry? Brother Spurgeon was a nasty biker. I promise you, underneath his suit and tie, he's covered with tattoos. That's the way bikers were. He was a member of uh, one of the uh, motorcycle gangs that was on the FBI's watch list of domestic terrorism. And um, in jail, God was able to reach into his heart and save him. And he's got a testimony like uh, uh, very few other people have. I was delighted. He's preached here at our church before. And I've still got his number on my cell phone. I suppose I could call him up any time and, and just ask him some questions if I needed to. But I was delighted to see that Pat Robertson, the 700 Club, actually did a segment about Brother Spurgeon's life and testimony. They profiled him on their, on their television show a few years ago. And I hope the Lord opens up more doors for him to preach and places for him to, to go and reach the lost. But he is able to speak to people that you and I would never be able to speak to because of his life, his experience, and so forth. So you and I aren't the final judge of uh, somebody else. God will be. And uh, the Bible says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, 
live peaceably with all men. Uh, Romans 12, verse 18. That means a Christian is supposed to get along with other Christians. You're not their judge, but you pray for them and trust they pray for you. And uh, between the two of you, you might accomplish something for Jesus' sake in eternity. Uh, now, if that's not possible between two Christians, then the best thing would be for one to separate from the other and that so that they're not stumbling, causing another person to stumble or getting in that person's way and go do what you believe God wants you to do and let them do what they think God has led them to do and pray for the other person to succeed for the sake of Jesus Christ. Too often, Christians uh, separate under bad circumstances and they're, they're hostile, they're enemies from that day on toward each other and shouldn't be the case. Paul says in our text, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, why we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Quote, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The judgment seat of Christ is where every Christian will be judged as to what he has done for the Lord Jesus Christ while he was a Christian living here in the world. What did you do with the talents and the abilities you possessed? How did you spend your time, your busy time, your free time? Did you seize any opportunity to try and uh, witness for Jesus Christ, even pass out a gospel track or uh, pray for somebody? Sometimes telling someone, listen, um, I'm going to pray for your need when I get home or once, you know, once we're not busy here at work, I, I promise you. Sometimes that's all it takes to be a real encouragement to somebody. Let them know that, that you mean it and follow through with it. Don't just tell them that to make them feel good and then drop the ball. Follow through and do it. You never know. Your, your attitude towards somebody else changes when you begin praying for them. If you start praying for your boss, your attitude as an employee to do the best job you can because he's got responsibilities and he or she is paying your, signing your paycheck and uh, they are obligated to you in certain ways, but you are likewise obligated to them. You start praying for them, pray for their salvation if they're not saved. It changes your, your attitude, your demeanor when you are around them to become a more productive employee, a better person on the job, a better employee uh, among the other people that work with you. And it, it changes you. Uh, someone has once said, uh, prayer might not change things, but it sure changes the person who prays. That's very true. And so how was your prayer life with God? That'll be uh, evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. Were you a, a diligent Bible student? If you had the Bible, and you had liberty to read it and freedom to do so and study it, did you do so? All of those things will be revealed uh, and exposed at the judgment seat of Christ. How was your intimate fellowship with God uh, during the week and all the rest? The judgment seat of Christ where a believer's life uh, as a believer will be judged. And at the judgment seat of Christ, after your works uh, and my works are judged in God's divine fire, uh, once anything we've done for Christ is known, if we've done anything that merits a reward from him, if there's any reward to be given for that work, then you will receive a reward in the form of a crown, according to the scriptures. And uh, Paul compares the believer's life to an athlete running in a marathon. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. William Carey famously said, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. That should be a, a, a motto of every true believer. He says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it, the athletes, to receive a corruptible crown. But we, an incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 and 25. The first crown given out to Believers is called an incorruptible crown from that text, 1 Corinthians 9. That's for faithful service to Jesus Christ and not being distracted or sidetracked onto other things. It's amazing how 
few Christians focus their attention on the things that are actually important. And that is being a good testimony, good servant of Jesus Christ, no matter what. Good times, bad times, financial uh, prosperity or financial devastation, doesn't matter. Uh, is your desire to please him with everything you possess. And uh, that is called an incorruptible crown. If you can live that way, uh, between now and the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll receive a, a crown, a crown uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, there's a crown called the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. That's given to them who are looking for and loving the soon appearing of Jesus Christ. Even when so many other Christians have stopped talking about it, it's amazing how much time professing Christians and true believers, people whose salvation I don't doubt, but they get sidetracked worrying about fixing some social problem in the world right now, uh, worrying about the next election, worrying about the midterms, worrying about their, who's going to get elected to Congress, uh, who's a more socialistic than the other candidate, uh, and so forth. They get sidetracked worrying about temporary things, temporal things, and they've lost sight of eternal things. They're not going outdoors, looking up into the sky, saying, could this be the day? Is this the day Jesus Christ will come back? But you know something? If you wake up every day and you go outside and say, I pray that this is the day that Jesus Christ says, come up hither. Eventually you'll be right. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 say, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then verse 10 says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's how you're supposed to live as a Christian. You're not saved by your good works, but you're saved unto good works, to be fruitful, to be uh, uh, diligent in doing something which will bring honor and glory ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. Turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's begin there at verse 11. Verses 11 down through 15. I'm going to try to move along here. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Notice that there is fire mentioned in connection with a Christian's judgment. It judges their works in this life. Don't ever let someone say, well, a God of love would never send any non-believer to a fiery judgment. Are you kidding me? There's fiery judgment involved in the Christian's judgment. And you and I are said to be friends of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 15, 15. If we're not going to be spared fire, don't you don't ever think that the unbeliever who dies without Christ is going to be spared fire. Also notice verse 13 there. So the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. It's the quality of the work, not the quantity. The quality, not the quantity. Will those things turn out to be of lasting value, like gold, silver, precious stones, or will they be uh, things of temporary value? They made you look good in the eyes of other people for a short time. Wood, hay, stubble. But then they burned up because they had no lasting substance. And then there's the crown of glory. That's given to faithful preachers, according to the Word of God. The word, the word pastor is a Latin word. It simply means shepherd. And Peter writes to the elders in Ephesus, Feed the flock of God which is among you, take the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, well, that eliminates Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis and a lot of these guys, but of a ready mind, 
That eliminates Joel Osteen. He's a moron. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. That eliminates every Catholic pope, every Anglican bishop, or any Methodist minister or Presbyterian minister who like their robes, they like their titles, more than they love God. But being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, Christ, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. 1 Peter 5, verses 2, 3, and 4. And then there's a fourth crown called the crown of life. And the references to that are James 1, verse 12, and Revelation 2, verse 10. And that is for those who endure temptations, trials, torture, even death, if it comes to that. For Jesus' sake, a martyr's crown. Of course, nobody seeks that crown. Nobody wants to earn that one. But if you're faithful in the first one, the crown of righteousness, then you should be able to fulfill the one here called the crown of life. But if any rewards are given at the judgment seat of Christ, they will be in the forms of crowns worn on the heads of the saints for their faithfulness in, in these different ways. And because our lives and works will be likened unto these items of different value, gold, silver, wood, hay, and so forth, then it's probably safe to assume that our station, our future position in the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ will probably also be determined at the judgment seat as well. Now, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 12, tells us, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Well, he's not going to, to deny you salvation, because he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And the Bible says God's already raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6. So he's not going to deny you salvation, but he will, he may deny you the right to have some sort of reign, some place of position and authority in that 1,000 year kingdom. The Lord is going to say to some, well done, good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, Matthew 25, verse 23. Would to God those words will be heard by every Christian in this room today. I pray that they will, but the Bible says, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17 And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24 and the Lord Jesus told us, Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 44. The rapture will catch away all the saints, and the first thing that you and I will uh, in, then encounter will be the judgment seat of Christ. Now you say, well, how long is that going to last? We always have these cartoon images uh, of millions and millions of believers over the centuries were all standing in line, right? Waiting our turn. And we move up. It's our turn. It's your turn. It may not be like that at all. You say, why do you say that? Well, because uh, the God who made time and space, by definition, is outside of time and space. He's not bound by those things. And uh, if you can type in the word conundrum in the Google search engine, get three and a half million uh, pages researched in half of a second. The God who made the mind of man certainly is much wiser than, than Google search engine. He could judge all believers of all the ages that fast. Everybody would be aware of what they did for Christ and therefore what rewards they may receive, what crowns. And they will be aware of how they may have failed Jesus Christ, how they failed the Lord. All of that could take place that fast. Point number two, besides the rapture, then what? 
not just the judgment seat of Christ, but after the judgment for believers, the next thing will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, I'm not going to have you to turn for time's sake, but Revelation chapter 19 and verses 7, 8, and 9 say, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Jesus is the groom, and the church, the body of all true believers, constitutes the bride of Jesus Christ. A marriage supper, though the, the wedding reception, that's a time of great joy and a celebration and love and rejoicing. The Bible says, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Revelation 19, verse 8 says there, the bride will be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. You know, the whole custom in the Western world, and I suspect in other parts of the world, uh, for the bride to be dressed in all white on her wedding day is to symbolize and, and picture uh, her purity, her virtue on that particular day. She has prepared herself and uh, reserved herself for one groom, for one bridegroom to whom she says I do and he to her and um, all of our young people young ladies and young men uh, don't get married one day wearing white and then have it be just hypocrisy because you've been fooling around don't do any of that get married in such a way that you can uh, wear a white dress because as a Christian you're not only identifying yourself with the bride of Christ, but you're reflecting the virtue that every Christian young woman, a Christian young man ought to have. I realize not all men wear a white tuxedo, but I promise you, your heart ought to be white, ought to be clean on your wedding day. So don't get married in such a way that uh, makes you a liar or a hypocrite on your wedding day. But um, the marriage supper of the Lamb will be the beginning of the glorious eternity of God's saints. At that time, you and I will have been changed to be immortal, uh, incorruptible, uh, like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of your sins as a Christian, all of your works or lack thereof, will have been revealed and judged by the Savior. Your rank in the millennium will have probably then be established before that time comes. And now you and I, along with every other believer over time, uh, will be in perfect union, not only with one another, but with the Savior who loved us enough to die for us. It's hard to wrap your mind around that, that concept completely, but that's nevertheless our future. Uh, in Bible times, a wedding feast wasn't just a few hours like it is today, but it lasted a an entire week and it was a full week long event we see this pattern in the story of Jacob being given the wrong wife Leah by his father-in-law Laban and uh, he told Jacob in uh, Genesis 29 fulfill her week and we will give thee this also he meant by that Rachel the one you really wanted to marry but it's not proper that the younger daughter should get married before her older sister and so he gives him the the, the older sister as his wife. He didn't ask for her. He worked seven years so he could to marry uh, Rachel. And uh, they have a week-long celebration. He has fulfilled her week, you know. Let me save face in front of all of my guests, and I promise you I'll give you the other daughter too. So they had one week-long wedding reception. He ended up with two wives, two sisters. I can't imagine anything more chaotic and troublesome than for a guy to be married to two sisters, both of them uh, drawn to the same husband. That's got to be one of the biggest pits a guy could ever step into. 
mean, I, I admire my sister and sisters-in-law, my wife's sister, but I don't want to be married to any of them. <laughs> I've got one wife. And um, Solomon learned after a thousand or seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines that one was enough. One true bride to whom his heart was knit and hers to him was worth all the others combined. But um, who knows if the caterers charged uh, Laban twice once they figured out, hey, you're, you're marrying off two daughters. Who knows what they did, but... But the seven years of tribulation on the earth are known as Daniel's 70th week, Daniel 9.27, which seems to match the pattern of a week-long uh, wedding reception. So I suppose the wedding marriage supper of the Lamb may be that seven years of tribulation. Just as Rachel and Leah fought and competed for the affections of the same husband, uh, sometimes a lot of Christians fight and they compete with one another for the affections or the attention of God. That shouldn't be. But in the body of Christ, and at the marriage supper of the Lamb, this might come to a shock to some of you, but there will be no Baptists. There will be no Methodists. There will be no Presbyterians, no Lutherans, no Episcopalians, no Anglicans. But all the body of Christ will be one, perfectly knit together by the saving grace and the saving mercy of Jesus Christ. Every saint of God will be dressed uh, in a way that pleases him and then possess the glorified image of Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave, immortal and incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 15 describes it for us. When all my labors and sorrows are over, I am, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. Let's stop right there, and let me bring this to a conclusion. But after the rapture, then what? Well, there will be the judgment seat of Christ, and then the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's bow for prayer, and we'll conclude uh, our service at this point. Heavenly Father, we thank you and uh, praise you for your goodness and kindness toward us. We ask that you'd make us to be good students of your Bible and to be living with a daily expectation and anticipation of the catching away of the saints, the rapture of the saints. Lord, we want to be with you. We want to dwell with you and live eternally with you. And we want our lives to matter for Jesus' sake. They want them, we want them to count and to be pleasing to thee until that hour comes. And so we ask that you would be, make us mindful of these things. Remind us, God, that we owe you a tremendous debt because of our salvation. We thank you for loving us, and we want to love you back today, Jesus. And we pray this now in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we'll take a little break.